AI in Action is brought to you by Aulis International, covering your business's staffing, consulting, and networking needs. Our host, Bar Kelly, brings you the leading minds in AI, sharing their story, their success, and their advice. Focusing on fast-tracking you to the top, AI in Action cuts through the hype to help you kickstart your data science career. To listen to the latest AI in Action podcast, head over to www.aldus.com forward slash podcast, or subscribe via iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Podcasts. Welcome to the AI in Action podcast. I'm your host, Mark Kelly. My guest today is David Bray. David is the Executive Director of People-Centered Internet Coalition and also a Senior Fellow with Institute for Human Machine Cognition. David, you're very welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Mark. Glad to be here. David, tell us a little bit about your background for the audience that don't necessarily know you. Sure. Uh, so I, I seem to have a, a, a desire to go to environments that are both thorny and, and sort of challenging both in terms of there are things that haven't been done before or are, are challenging to do that involve both humans and technology. Um, examples include uh, back in the 90s, I had a, a great opportunity when I was uh, fairly young to work with the uh, U.S. Department of Defense in a place called the Institute for Defense Analyses involving small satellites and, and early uses of the small satellites to do uh, what later would be called uh, geospatial information systems. Uh, and what we were doing was taking satellite imagery from these satellites, trying to analyze foliage conditions, uh, wind conditions, topography. And specifically, I got the opportunity to uh, pioneer a prototype of a forest fire forecaster, where if you pick up a forest fire, signs of it from space, could you then try and guess where it might go? And that ended up, after about a year and a half, being successful. Uh, after that, I then, in the 2000 period, uh, signed up for a place called the Centers for Disease Control in the United States. They do public health. And, and, and specifically, I was part of a small team, 30 people, that was called the Bioterrorism Preparedness and Response Program. And our goal was to respond if, uh, if there was ever a uh, bioterrorism event in the United States. And it had actually been scheduled uh, weeks in advance that I was going to give an update to the FBI uh, CIA and, and other folks uh, as to what we would do if a biotism event happened and it was scheduled for September 11th, 2001 at 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, unfortunately, of course, uh, tragedy hit. That briefing was canceled at 8.34 uh, because the world changed and we uh, dealt with the response to 9-11. Um, it, it was about three weeks of not a lot of sleep. So down on October 1st, ended up giving that briefing on October 3rd. And when we got back to Atlanta, uh, the first case of uh, anthrax was found about 24 hours later. So it was a very busy time. And uh, it's one of those things where um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of if you can keep your head about you while all are losing theirs and blaming it on you. Uh, it's, it's those types of environments where you're trying to help make sense of what's going on. Um, more recently, in the last uh, six or seven years, have uh, spent some time both focusing on research and development efforts of the U.S. intelligence community as a civil servant, uh, spent four years as what I call a digital diplomat and human flak jacket as chief information officer for the Federal Communications Commission uh, here in the United States, and in 2017 uh, became executive director for what's called the People-Centered Internet Coalition, uh, which was co-founded by Vint Cerf, one of the creators of the internet, and really what we're trying to do is demonstration projects that measurably improve people's lives using the internet. I think, David, I could, I could start in so many different ways. A lot of people are saying, seeing so many benefits of AI in action, but there's also some challenges that pose to business, to business in terms of what kind of technology takes away from ourselves. And there is 30 human rights that digital technology can sometimes be eroding those, those rights as well. And you do you kind of love a lot of conversations around that and some of the challenges that are actually posed uh, in that. Can maybe kind of tell us some of the, your research and some of the stuff that you've kind of seen most recently in that regard? Sure. Uh, so you're absolutely right that, that, that technology itself is amoral. It's, it's how we choose how to use it that decides whether it, it has uh, ultimately good outcomes or bad outcomes. And uh, partly why the People's Internet Coalition was founded is Vint, Cerf, and, and others were, were over the last three to four years uh, looking at what was happening, this is around the 2015-2016 time frame with the internet, and, and seeing that, that, this, that what was intended as a force for good, that, that, that the internet, if you can remember the, the, the energy and the excitement of the 90s, that, that it was going to uh, bring greater understanding, it was gonna help uh, bring people online, 
greater access to knowledge, and, and we, would, we, would, we would have greater transparency and greater understanding as to what was going on. And, and if you feel like you look at the last two to three years, while some of that has happened, there's also a concern that it may be polarizing us more, uh, especially in open societies. Um, the great news about the Internet is anyone can print whatever they want. The bad news about the Internet is anyone can print whatever they want. And so it's also creating questions of what's, what's real, what's real information. Um, and, and so we, we, should, we should expect similarly with AI that those who intend it to be a force for good may find there are unintended second or third order effects um, that they never planned for. Um, and, and, and unless that sounds speculative, let's make it more practical that in 2009, uh, with the Mumbai terrorist attacks, uh, web search, social media, GPS was, were actually used to both plan the attacks and unfortunately figure out who they were going to execute. And so, you know, the, the tools that you and I use on a daily basis can also unfortunately be used for less than good purposes. And so with AI, simply because it is an emerging technology, businesses are right to, to, to want to go with their best foot forward and make sure it is a force for good. And at the same time, strive to think about what might be the second or third order effects. So this is not just an academic exercise, but you know, how do you make sure that when you roll it out, you are uplifting people, um, making it something that is more human-centric in nature, and that ideally, especially for, for those of us that come from Western cultures, that it does not become something where either we're now becoming servants to the machine, or it becomes a source of surveillance, whether it's in the workplace, at home or, or in our personal lives that we never intended it to actually be that. And this kind of ties in nicely to kind of practical AI ethics, you know, what, what an organization can practically think about and things they need to be mindful for where several years ago they didn't necessarily think about these things. Yes, a hundred percent. And in fact, with practical AI ethics, um, I'll be in an event uh, speaking uh, on December 10th about the, the importance of recognizing that we are 70 years since the UN Declaration of Human Rights. You mentioned that there are, there are 30 human rights, uh, as, as stated by the UN after World War II. One, I would challenge how many people know all what the 30 rights are. And then two, you know, if, if you look at what's happened since World War II, uh, while, while by some measures we have made progress in advancing human rights around the world, in other cases we've either stalled out or maybe even backslid a little. Um, if, you, if you think about what's happened in the last decade. And, and so I think this raises an important consideration as we go into this period of increasing technological change, especially technological change as advanced by uh, what's possible with AI and automation. And one, can we make sure that we continue to make progress on those 30 human rights? And then two, what additional human rights are necessary. And, and to tie that to practical AI ethics, one of the things I recommend to companies uh, and organizations when they think about you know, how can you put this in real terms and, and not be paralyzed by this consideration, but in fact be emboldened and actually have a good way forward that is also at the same time mindful of, of, of people and the impacts of technology on communities. And, and what I recommend is think about a simple two by two table. First part on the left-hand side top, is thinking about what are your obligations in that context. And just do simple bullets. What do you think your obligations are to either your customers, to your stakeholders, uh, if you're a nonprofit or a government organization, to maybe citizens, uh, to the community? Spell out the obligations and just make little bullets. Then on the right hand top, right next to that, then, then put out what are things that maybe you're, you're, you're aware are possible biases or blind spots. All of us as humans, we, we, our, our experiences shape us, and that's great. The experiences give us expertise, and at the same time, they also may, may limit other fields that we may not know or, or, or may limit things that we, we perceive things as. And so spelling out those blind spots or biases are particularly key for AI because we know machine learning is only as good as the data that's fit into it. The neural networks are only as good as the data fit into it. And if that data is biased, then the machine and the outcomes will be biased too. And, and the nature of AI is it's actually kind of focused to be biased because it's trying to generate certain results. So it's, it's, going, to be, it's going to be fed that bias. And it's not necessarily a, a negative thing that it is biased because it's, it's worked off the input. So it's just working on how the quality of the data. You, you, you hit on a very key point, which is exactly that, which is, the, the fine line between becoming an expert in how you view the world 
and becoming biased, in some respects, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. For example, Frank Lloyd Wright, an amazing architect, he was, you know, he, he built some really creative and visionary buildings that to this day, you know, are, are still remarkable for their design and structure. At the same time, Frank Lloyd Wright was an awful engineer. Uh, some of his buildings are now falling apart because they weren't engineered well. And, and so they, by becoming an expert in one field, there were other areas where maybe he was not as good at that. And it would have been better to pair Frank Lloyd Wright with an amazing engineer and maybe while you're at it, a, a, a landscaper or a conservationist, and you would have had a much better outcome. And so you're absolutely right that the same thing is true with machine learning, which as we train the machine to key into certain facets, we are making it biased to what we believe to be ground truth and where things need to go. At the same time, we need to be mindful that is it representative? Because for example, we know, unfortunately, currently there are certain machine facial recognition algorithms that cannot recognize people of a certain minority status just because the machine has not been trained enough on those data sets. Yeah. And that's wrong, and that's an announcement that's not right. And so we humans have to raise our hands and say, we need a better way to do that. And the other, the other aspect, and I remember you were telling me this off air, is that you know, sometimes it can take between 10 to 25 years to figure out good and bad of a technology. So when you're yeah. actually working with something that's relatively new, you need to be mindful that we don't necessarily figure things out until it can sometimes be too late. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And in fact, yeah, if you look at sort of the last 150 years, um, some have said it takes between 10 to 25 years for we humans to figure out what are the good uses and the bad uses of, of any type of technology. And, and unless that sounds hypothetical, uh, in World War I, apparently, uh, the UK government thought that submarines were an unethical form of warfare. And so they chose not to go down that path. And rightly or wrongly, of course, we know it later played itself out in World War II. And so it usually takes a generation to both sort of almost play with, experiment with, learn from. And I think that that, that is key to recognize that we are all learning, that no one is going to come out with a magic textbook that will say, here's how to do everything. Um, in fact, with that, that, that framework, when I talk to people is, is by spelling out your obligations and your awareness of your blind spots, then the bottom part is, is becomes easy from that because we're really just spelling out what are your responses to your obligations, what things you proactively want to do. And then the last part is what are your safeguards to those blind spots or those biases? What are those things that maybe you're now reaching out to members of the community or members of your customer base? And you're just asking them to almost sort of provide continuous feedback because you always want to be learning. You always want to be advancing as an organization and say, look, we don't have the answers to everything, but we're going to put our best foot forward. We're going to do as best we can. We may be wrong sometimes, or we may need to adjust how we're rolling out this new technology. That is part of the process. And we do that because there is no textbook for how we roll out this AI. That said, we are committed making it a force for good in the world. Which, which really kind of brings that to the point that uh, when we're actually looking to add the ethics and we're trying to take into consideration all the pitfalls, we really need to kind of design ethical considerations with a variety of different diverse stakeholders rather than just having kind of white 30 year old males who are living in Silicon Valley building these uh, algorithms. 100%. And, and in some respects, I mean, the algorithm itself the algorithms we're using by and large for machine learning and neural networks have been around since the 80s and, and, and can be expressed mathematically. Uh, and so in some respects, less concerned about the algorithm, although obviously then how it's eventually implemented and how it's used in the organization, that becomes key. Much more concerned about is the data set representative, because if the data is missing certain features or if it unfortunately focuses on one group versus another group, that could be both good or bad. Um, uh, again, coming from public health and epidemiology, we often say we're often aware that, you know, just because you're picking up an increased incidence of, say, flu in one part of the country doesn't mean that other parts of the country aren't having flu, too. It might just be that you don't have enough epidemiologists on the ground or enough sensors to pick it up. And so you have to be cautious about what conclusions you make from data alone because if the data collection itself is focusing on one area and not on another area, you may reach wrong conclusions about either prevalence of something or behaviors or something, or just something about that, that, that system that you're trying to understand. And then that will obviously bias the machine as well. So, and yeah. so I, I actually increasingly think that, that you need to have what I call data ombudsmen or ombuds that basically are 
responsible for making sure that there is a representative diversity in the data being used, and then similarly that the outcomes that are made or the decisions that are made from that data are not considered to be uh, against the ethics and the morals of that company. You're listening to the AI in Action podcast. I'm speaking with David Bray. David is the Executive Director of People Centered Internet Coalition and also a Senior Fellow with Institute for Human Machine Cognition. David, on December 10th, this is 70 years human rights anniversary. And David's been telling us a little bit about practical AI ethics, talking about what an organization practically can think about, the importance of being kind of eyes wide open and aware of biases and just being kind of mindful for some of the decisions that you're going to make when you're applying new technology as well. David, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks for having me, Mark. I really appreciate it. AI Action is brought to you by Aldus International, covering your business's staffing, consulting, and networking needs. Aldus offer an exec search program. Aldus can help you discover how data science and AI can transform your company. With our unrivaled network of C-suite executives and senior AI professionals, we offer retained search services across the US and Europe. For more information, contact mark at aldus.com. Get the Aldus advantage. Become a member of the Aldus community and enjoy some of the following. AI meetups. Once a month, our community gathers to listen to some of the leading experts in the world of data science and AI. Our speakers come from all over the world, including Dublin, Boston, and Frankfurt. We also have our AI mentors. Our experts will provide mentoring to all the members. And don't forget our AI in Action podcast. Each week, we have guests from all over the world talking us through their education, career, and more. Become an Aldus member and get the Aldus advantage. For more information and to sign up for our newsletter, log on to www.aldus.com. Dot com. That's www.aldus.com. Aldus International, empowering through AI.